science. We get experimental yes. science. We're curious, non judgmental. Hello, everyone. To follow the scientific method, my name is Veronica Ripley. Uh, I go by Nicotine Online, and I'm extremely excited to bring to you today a very exciting panel full of some wonderful guests. We're going to go through everyone here in just a second, but I want to give a big thank you to all of you for coming. So, thank you. here at the table and once we learn everybody's names we're going to go a little more in depth into what their content and careers are like so without further ado down the list here we've got uh go, why don't you go right ahead sure uh, i'm danny anduza uh, i stream on twitch under the name paleontologizing and i'm a dinosaur paleontologist and uh my name <laughs> First, we just wanted to thank everyone for coming out today and for Twitch for giving us this opportunity to talk about the importance of science on an educational platform that's usually used for games. Uh, my name is Belint. I'm actually one third of Science Streams. I'm an ant geneticist. We run the channel with my wife, who's also a molecular biologist, and our nine month old daughter. magmas and try to understand what makes volcanoes erupt. I am so appreciative of Twitch just for existing and giving us this space, but also for all of you. I, if you're, you know, if, if you're not new, or if you're new to, to me or have never met me before, I would have not been able to finish my PhD without my Twitch community and everybody's support and encouragement. And I just, I'm just so appreciative of all of you guys for coming today. about outer space and astrobiology. Um, sometimes I dabble into other things and video games, but we'll be getting into that soon. Um, and yeah, I'm really stoked that we have a panel here. I think science outreach on Twitch is really important, and it's something I've been doing a really long time. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here. It means a lot to me. Uh, so I'm Ned Wiener. Uh, my background is in space and astronomy, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But I also want to just thank everyone for showing up to this panel, and uh, hopefully we can express some of the excitement that we feel for streaming science on Twitch and educational content. I would also like to introduce Ben, our ASL interpreter here. Is there anyone here who would desire an ASL interpreter? Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. dinosaur paleontologist. Um, shoot, I feel like I'm on stream right now. <laughs> most of you probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. Uh, most fossil scientists don't work on dinosaurs, which is kind of a misperception that the public has. But uh, I do work on dinosaurs, and that's what I do on stream. Um, so I do uh, field work streams, like streaming from the badlands of uh, places like Montana, Utah, Wyoming, digging up dinosaurs live on stream. And uh, yeah, when I'm not out in the field, um, I'm conducting research on dinosaurs, publishing papers, that kind of thing, and uh, yeah, I, during the beginning of COVID, I started streaming on Twitch, and this has actually become my livelihood. This is actually how I make my living nowadays. It's sometimes hard to make a living as a scientist, but Twitch allows me to do that. Um, so yeah, so big thanks to uh, everybody who runs Twitch, and of course to all of the viewers and everybody else. So it's been such a wonderful opportunity here. Um, yeah, so. What do paleontology live streams look like on Twitch? Well, when I'm back in the office, when I'm not in the field, we go over things like fossil news. Right there, you see the, the sign news image. Uh, that's actually a, uh, a kind of dinosaur that was brand new in 2020. Uh, this is the first ever dinosaur that has my name on the author's list. Um, it's called Trirarchuncus. It's a little insect-eating dinosaur. The name actually means Captain Hook because it's got these ridiculous little hook-like claws. And uh, it's an insect-eating dinosaur, and I, uh, yeah, I uh, didn't actually know the paper was going to be coming out, so I was able to cover that live on stream in 2020, soon after I started, and that was 
hugely exciting for me. And uh, I actually sculpted it um, in a digital sculpting software and then 3D printed it. So that kind of bluish model you see right there is one that, uh, that I sculpted and later 3D printed. So I do a lot of 3D printing, 3D modeling, and lots and lots of viewer Q&A. So that's really the bread and butter of the streams is people coming in and asking questions. Everybody's got questions about dinosaurs. And so, uh, yeah, usually it's kind of a mad dash to try and get through all of the viewer questions by the end of the stream. Uh, it's, it's always a ton of fun. Yeah, and then this past summer, I was really lucky to actually be able to stream live from the field. Um, yeah, we sometimes have difficulty finding money to actually be able to go out and dig up dinosaurs. Um, you know, dollar for dollar, I think dinosaur paleontology is one of the most like cost-effective sciences where sometimes we only need a few hundred or a few thousand bucks to go out and dig up a bunch of dinosaurs. We didn't have that money, but we were able to raise that through the community and uh, yeah, get at least three new species of dinosaur excavated this summer. Um, and I was able to stream it via satellite with, uh, with Starlink. And it's, uh, it's a pretty cool experience to be able to bring this live field work to an audience at home and be able to answer their questions live and, and show them that you know, digging up dinosaurs isn't like what you see in the movie Jurassic Park. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it can be a lot more tedious, but, um, and it's hard work. Uh, it was really, really hot out in the summer. That was, brought a thermometer out with me and I kept showing the camera, you know, it was 110 degrees today, you know. But uh, yeah, being able to bring that home, I think was, was really cool and uh, yeah, yeah, really proud that we were able to do that. Nice, very good. Uh, thank you. Next up we have Cy Ants. Tell us a little bit about what you do. What's your content like? Who are you? That's a great question because only half of me is here, right? Uh, so Lita is the other half, who's my much better half. And we started live streaming on Twitch because we were doing visit school visits before COVID and teaching kids about science and the world shut down. So what do you do? We saw Danny on Twitch. We didn't even know with, uh, you know, science on Twitch was a thing. I thought it was just gaming and we thought maybe we can try that as well. And so we've been doing uh, live streams on the platform. Both of us have our doctorates in molecular biology. Um, we did, we both have our masters in immunology and evolution. And so we speak from a perspective of bio biology and the biological context of how evolution happens, but also doing live experiments on Twitch. And we've been published multiple times uh, before and after we started streaming. Uh, so you might be wondering, well, what's the content? What, what does this scientist up here with the ants do? Um, so some of the things that we do, Go over on the next slide, we've got some images. Um, we do a lot of character modeling uh, because we do school visits uh, across the gambit. We've actually done a fair bit of uh, 2D artwork trying to teach people that insects are not gross. So I've done 10 years in fruit flies and I can tell you a lot of people think that they're pretty nasty. Um, but if you start doing cartooning first, then maybe a kid will ask, well, why is this ant dress as Harley Quinn? And then it doesn't matter if they're gross or not. You can start telling them about how they're all ladies. They're all genetically identical and yet they look, act, look and act different, and why is that? Uh, we're also developing a video game to try to teach people about the science behind it. We've done 3D printing, we do live ant streams, we've also done live field work where we've begun to collect samples and look at them under a microscope later on. And I think that's the biggest highlight of our stream is really the microscope part, because you get to see tiny worlds that you could never see before. And uh, finally, on the last slide. Oh. oh. <laughs> There's our little artwork. Yeah. That's adorable. And oh, there's the, more. And there's the game too, yeah. That's adorable too. <laughs> um, I think again, one of the coolest things is that we, like, all at Jurassic Park, we have 30 million year olds amber, up to 90 million that we look at under the scope, and as a group identify what the insects are. So you get to learn what the process is of how to be doing field work and what the animals are that we're talking about. And uh, that ant right there is 90, 90 million years old around the time of the dinosaurs, and it is the ancestral origin of all modern day ants. So we get to look at that live on the stream. There's also mosquitoes, tardigrades, and more. So it's very interactive, Q&A driven, and we derail a lot. You can trigger a lot of animations to have <laughs> Wonderful. That's great, I love that. Uh, next up we have Volcano Dog. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm a volcano scientist. <laughs> uh, no, I started streaming uh, during the pandemic as well. Uh, I was actually teaching a natural hazards and disasters course at the university I was, I was at. And I started recording my lectures and just getting to teach people about the way that our earth works. I love it and I love being able to 
show people the way that I can see the world. And so uh, here the, I don't know if it'll animate, but the second one, that is what a, oh no, you can go, sorry, I'll go back. Sorry. Yeah, the, so uh, that is what a rock looks like underneath the microscope. Uh, I was able to raise funds, to think, like between family and my community members, we're able to raise enough funds to purchase a microscope. So we look at rocks underneath the microscope on stream. I do a lot of my own research on streams, so uh, we even have some, like I haven't even been published, uh, if you want to go to the next slide. This was the big eruption in Tonga that erupted in January of 2022, and the next day we were on stream looking at all this cool stuff that was coming out on the internet, and I'm not, if it, hopefully it'll play the little globe thing. Oh, this, uh, ah, bummer. Sorry. Um, that's okay. The eruption was so powerful that it literally shook the atmosphere and sent an energy wave around the globe three and a half times. And we found the uh, like stereo retrieval heights. We were looking at them with 3D glasses on stream and we're able to cobble together all of this information that was on social media that scientists were sharing. Yeah, look at them. This thing went halfway to space, 58 kilometers, halfway to friggin' space. It's so huge. It's literally the analog to 1883 Krakatoa. It's an amazing, the, the mechanics of this eruption are phenomenal. It's like a nuclear explosion when magma and water come into contact. And you can actually tell that that happened from the ash fractures. And this other video is the satellite footage of the plume overlaying with lightning strikes. If it will roll, you can see the, the turbulence of the eruption plume. And so from that, we were able to learn a lot about the eruption and worked really, really hard and was able to, next slide, publish this paper. This is the first paper about that eruption and we got it done in three months. And had it not been for watching these things with the community on stream and answering questions and just having excitement about it, uh, you know, this project never would have happened. And I like being able to show behind the scenes what science is like. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of Excel. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, um, and th but there are those fascinating, exciting discoveries, and I just want to be able to share my passion with you. Wonderful. Was there an animation for this one too? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. Moe Hoodles, tell us a little bit about why this emote is so adorable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're missing my first slide, but that's okay. Oh, I am. It was just, oh, no, so it's sorry. not a big issue. You can. Or it's around anyways. Um, yeah, hi, I'm a Hoodles. Um, I've been streaming since 2014. Uh, my degree is actually in computer science, but I do science communication on outer space and astrobiology. Uh, they're huge passions of mine. I'm really hoping to like apply my degree into the field someday, but you know, I just graduated, so give me a little time. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm also, uh, I have ADHD, so I'll be like checking notes on my phone to make sure I don't forget everything ever. Um, I'm also a, a member of the Twitch Women's Guild, so I'm really hoping to um, maybe inspire some women or, or talk them up to join us doing um, science communication on Twitch and even just getting into STEM fields. I think it's super important. You are like so welcome and so important to be here, so thank you. Um, also, uh, my stream, like I said, is mainly on astrobiology. I do current news on uh, you know outer space and everything, Sorry. with some occasional deep dives. Uh, sometimes I also talk about sharks and conservation and programming as well. So hence my emotes. Uh, sharks are just my favorite animal and, you know, make them space sharks. Why not? <laughs> um, yeah, and I also play, oh, sorry, I was still on the last slide. Oh, sorry, I sorry. Also, no, you're all good. Um, I also do video games, uh, like from retro stuff to newer things. I've been doing, doing a lot of Starfield, and I bring the science education into the video games I play too, and kind of back and forth, which is fun. Um, and yeah, essentially my streams are like space, Sharks, snorts, science, sound effects, like snort laugh at my own bad jokes all the time. Um, and yeah, pretty enthusiastic. I have fun reactions, but overall, I think my streams are pretty chill. So, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> um, Got a couple more. Yeah. And this one, I just wanted to include um, the like JWST Advanced Extra Galactic Survey. I feel like I missed a word there. Um, but that's the background on my stream. There's over 45,000 galaxies in that right photo, and it's so pretty. It's just this small little part of this like huge deep field that they're taking, and I'm so excited for it. 
Um, and then the picture on the left is um, the Earthrise photo, and that kind of sparked a conservation movement uh, back here on Earth because, you know, look at our beautiful pale blue dot right there. Um, so I know a lot of my interests seem kind of all over the place, like conservation and sharks and programming and space, but they all have a lot of really cool overlap, and that's my favorite stuff to talk about on stream. So, yeah. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. There's also... I don't. I feel like we don't have time for those, just so we can answer. All that. <laughs> it's all good. Essentially, that's me being like, "Hey, you all can be a citizen scientist." Yeah, a really big close up of my face. I, I try to hype up the citizen science and get people into STEM. Um, the other one is me just kind of talking about accretion disks on black holes and stuff um, and being silly. So, <laughs> um, it's all my featured clips on my Twitch page and stuff. But yeah, it's it's fine. <laughs> I want to make sure we can get to all the questions, so it's all good. Um, gorgeous, like rabbit. Ah, there we go. Mm -hmm. I had to skip forward like four slides. <laughs> okay. That's all good. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Nerdwino, Thank uh, are you as in demand as the namesake? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Certainly as rare. Yeah, I'm definitely as rare, but uh, no, not as in demand, sadly. Uh, so my background is in astronomy, as I said at the beginning. I have a PhD in astronomy from the University of Illinois, and I have an undergrad in, uh, and a master's in engineering from the University of Cambridge in England. Uh, I worked for NASA at the Jet Propulsion Lab for about 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, uh, where I worked on some cool astronomy stuff. My research was in cosmology, so sort the of cosmic microwave background, the Big Bang, that kind of stuff. Um, and now I stream on Twitch, and try and get people jazzed about science, try and maybe uh, encourage people to think critically about different things instead of just accepting what they're being told by, you know, by various places. Uh, we do live rocket, we cover a bunch of live rocket launches, which is getting increasingly difficult because the launch cadence now is crazy. There's like a launch every day, so I can't. But we do like all the big NASA ones, uh, some of the big SpaceX ones, you know, super heavy, all that stuff. Uh, and those are really fun. Um, a shout out to the NASA folks that are here for doing the coverage for us. Uh, I, we do some space Lego builds on stream. Um, we play some space-based games, like the said. said. Um, play Astroneer, some of the more techie science games and space games. Um, and, and then we just talk about the latest science and space news, uh, try and get people excited about that. And if there's events. Um, the, so the one picture there is actually a launch from Vandenberg. I think it was a Starlink satellite, but yeah, you can see the launch. Um, you can see some of the Lego projects there, and then I also have bees, so we keep bees in the backyard, which is like a totally random thing, but chat really gets excited about it, and I live stream some of the hive, uh, some of the, the hive inspections, which sometimes ends up with me getting stung in the face, or whatever, but uh, people, people seem to like the variety, and it makes a change from just the, the science content. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, this is our panelists. Uh, big thank you again for coming all the way out here. Thank you for coming here too. Uh, we're going to start asking some questions. Uh, if you have a question, please think of it and hold it because we have a couple of questions we're going to ask first. <laughs> but we will be opening up the floor for questions, so please think of something you would like to ask our lovely panelists. To kick things off, I would like to ask what motivated you to start streaming and why do you stream? Uh, this is for anyone, so just go ahead and buzz in whenever you... Uh, Science. Buzz. Um, so I come from a background where professors in the lab that we worked for looked down on science communication. And they said that it is what a failed scientist does. And they said, we don't, shouldn't talk to the public, because why would you ever do that? They should just listen to us. And to me, that feels wrong. I think it's the mission statement of any scientist to do outreach, to talk to people about what they're doing because they're in a position of great privilege. And unless you do that, I think you're already failing as a scientist. And so my wife and I, we saw this, you know, she's a scientist too, we saw this opportunity and we just jumped at it. And it's giving, as Nerdwino said, access to folks, to scientists, not just to take into what we're saying. I want you to come in and question it. I want you to come in and tell me, why should I genetically engineer a mosquito that can't re reproduce and release it in the wild? What are the consequences? Ask me those hard-hitting questions because that's the point of why we have this dialogue. There's nothing that drives me crazier when scientists come out and tell you you should believe this because I said it. It's not how our society works, nor should it. So come in, ask questions, and that's our goal of being on the stream. Wonderful. Yeah. Does anyone else have some thoughts? 
I mean, gosh, okay, I started streaming in 2014 and it was a different time, so I literally started streaming just because I thought I was funny and maybe entertaining. Uh, but that has blossomed into something super amazing. Um, so now if I were to answer that question or like start streaming now, I think it'd be because uh, science outreach is really important and we can educate people and inspire people to go into STEM fields or even just nerd out and have communities um, with other people that you might not have like in real life and we can make this awesome, awesome community online where everyone can, um, you know, just kind of nerd out and be together and hang out in a relaxed environment, I think is nice. It's kind of hopefully like easing the anxiety of like getting into science stuff. Like if you know nothing about space, like you're still welcome in my stream and you can still learn something and ask questions. But if you know a lot, you're also welcome, you know what I mean? It really tears down the, the sense that people might have of like the intimidation of science because it's so yeah. casual, right? Streaming is like so, much more casual than going like a college course, you know? Yes, exactly, thank you. Yeah, I love that, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's important that people get to see that scientists aren't just like shut up in a lab somewhere doing research. And as I think it was me or whoever said, that you should just accept whatever answers are handed down. Right, we have to show that we're approachable, we're people just like you. We, the scientific process can be messy. We don't know all the answers and just because we tell, say like, oh, this is what we know so far, that doesn't mean that's necessarily the right answer. That's just the answer that we have right now, and we have to continue to do the research. And I think to see for people to see that and to be able to interact on in chat and talk to people with science backgrounds, I think it makes it more accessible. I think that's important, and that was one of the reasons why I got into it. Although, shout out to my Warzone streamers out there because I got into, actually got into it through people in a Warzone chat. They're like, "Oh, you're a scientist. You should stream." No, they don't want to be interested. They took me into it. So here we are. Absolutely. Uh, does anyone else have any? I think it's, it, for me, it's mostly about increasing accessibility. I have a very non-traditional background for a scientist. I uh, am actually a high school dropout, and I got pregnant in high school and worked my way up, and I like to share that story because I know that not enough people have opportunities that like we were so lucky to have. Half of it is hard work and half of it is luck, and I want to provide people a place where they can come in and just genuinely ask questions and not feel bad about them. I think it's so important that we as scientists let you know that we don't know everything. And I will be the first to say, oh, I don't know. And I will also admit when I'm wrong. And I love doing that on stream and showing that, yeah, I mean, I have an education, but I'm not infallible at all. And I sure don't know a lot of stuff. I can barely work a remote. So <laughs> I, it's, it's really about just being able to have a space where somebody can come in and ask questions free of judgment and, you know, be treated with dignity and respect. Yeah, definitely. And none of us know how to work the remote. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> how about you? Yeah. Um, I'd like to echo some of the same points and also bring up the... Uh, I, I think my journey to Twitch is... Uh, I think it kind of illustrates how wonderful this platform can be for science outreach. Um, I've done some other outreach in the past, uh, a lot of stuff in person, and then when COVID started, I could no longer go out to museums and give tours and stuff like that. So I discovered Twitch, and like suddenly this world opened up. The wonderful thing about Twitch is that uh, not a lot of people about it, not a lot of people on the platform know that there's a lot of science on here, and so it's not preaching to the choir. People don't come to Twitch looking for science content, but people stumble in, people who didn't even realize that they could be interested in science. People who think, oh, science isn't for me. Science is just for, you know, uh, like middle-aged white men in, white, in lab coats, uh, you know, in a laboratory somewhere. Science is so much more than that, and anybody can do science. You have to have passion, you have to have curiosity, and uh, I think that's kind of what drew a lot of us to this platform, it's that desire to, uh, to show everybody that. Absolutely. I mean, that's uh, bringing down that barrier is so important, and and bringing science interest to a platform like Twitch is so so needed. Science content on Twitch is really I love the cutting edge of content that you can find on a platform like Twitch. Because when most people think of Twitch, they're starting to think of video games less and less, and they're starting to think of like podcast and entertainment a lot more. So it's really really cool that uh, that so many like wonderful science. Con so, so much wonderful science content has come out in the last like few years. It's just delightful to see. 
how do you make science content relatable to this kind of platform? Because we've talked about how there's that barrier. How do you reach out and actually relate to the average Twitch chatter? Go ahead. I'll start, yeah. I think for a dinosaur paleontologist, it's particularly easy because everybody loves dinosaurs. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not an uphill battle at all. Um, but I think uh, kind of showing people that one of the things I talk about a lot is how uh, many important dinosaur discoveries are not made by professional scientists. They're made by amateur collectors, or they're made by regular people just out walking their dogs or watching birds or hiking and stuff like that. And they stumble upon a dinosaur skeleton. And I think that's immensely, it's an immensely powerful thing to hear if you're just a general member of the public and if you're interested in these things. Um, so I guess for a dinosaur paleontologist, the, the accessibility part is kind of already built in a little bit. Um, but I think being able to show that live through fieldwork live streams and, uh, and live Q&A, uh, it kind of brings it to life. And I think for us, it's the opposite. First question I usually get is, how do I kill the ants and how do I kill the fruit flies? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, if you ask that question first, like, heck, I can talk to you, I can hook you. We can talk about how you can gaslight an ant <laughs> in, in your kitchen and trick it and it actually loses trust from the rest of the colony. How do we kill the ants, though? So you put out a piece of sugar, the ants come, they, the scout samples it, it goes back. When it comes back, oh, you've gotten rid of the sugar, you cleaned up the area. The other scouts are like, wait, this ant lied, and they don't come back. So you can gaslight an ant. <laughs> but one of the big things that we do to make it accessible, I feel, is we even have rolling messages of, if you are uncomfortable to ask a question, DM a mod, and we'll answer it anonymously. When I was in seventh grade, I remember I asked questions because I was really excited about this random topic that was not on what we were chatting about that day. And the next day, there was the Balint rule that was enacted, which you cannot ask off-topic <laughs> questions in this classroom anymore. I'm like, well, so the, our stream is the exact opposite. We derail a lot. Uh, you can come in and hit all kinds of crazy redemptions. I can get squished by a Sonic uh, suit-wearing ant, because if you didn't know, Sonic Hedgehog is actually a gene in developmental biology named after the video game character. And so we try to integrate you know, games, music, art, and I'm really proud of the community that we built because we have so many non-scientists that come in and they're like, you know, we get rated by video game streamers and music streamers and art streamers, and everyone's like, this is cool, they're looking under a microscope. And it's just that visual element of getting people excited and that it isn't, like Volcano Knock was saying, we're not necessarily, we're, we don't know everything. And a lot of times I get asked a question, I'm like, you know, I have no idea, but here's how I would test it. And it's breaking down that barrier of how do you come up with a scientific process, how do you design an experiment? Because that's all a scientist is, is someone who's curious and wants to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I think one of the challenges for me can be the audiences can be quite diverse, right? So obviously I have a very technical background and I can get into the weeds a little bit too much. And there's a, a lot of technical people that are attracted to my stream because of my background and stuff. But I also have a lot of general people and again, musicians and artists and gamers. So it can be tricky to kind of balance the content in the stream so that everybody is kind of satisfied and no one feels left out and everyone can understand the content. So that's definitely, that's kind of a challenge, I think. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna say, I guess um, some things that I do to like make science content relatable um, is, you know, we read a lot of current news and that's just things happening right now. It's stuff that you can go outside and see. You can go to your local astronomy club, check it out, um, you know, like borrow a telescope or whatever. Um, even like the annular eclipse that happened last weekend, like we were really hyping that up on stream and educating everyone about it so they could go outside and, and check it out if they were in areas or watch the NASA live stream of it. Um, so I think that's, that's one way. Um, another way that I make the science content relatable is um, kind of bringing it into the video games, like I mentioned before. Um, like I've been playing Starfield, I'm a xenobiologist in game. I am bringing my astrobiology knowledge into the game and like nerding out about it, talking about all of these environments that like life could, that life could exist in and everything else. Um, so I think finding that overlap of like, there's a lot of gamers on this platform. They're into space. They're into these space games. I'm gonna tell them that I also do education stuff on it and just kind of mesh everything together. And I feel like there's so many space nerds everywhere too. So it's just so cool. <laughs> Show of applause. How many of you got to actually see the eclipse last week? So many people who don't live in Portland, Oregon. 
How about you? The Ball cloud game. cover helped. I I'm, oh, I was able to see it in Portland. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was in bed. <laughs> Same boat as Danny, it's pretty easy. Volcanoes are exploding and they're cool. That's, that's, I mean, that's why I like them. That, that's genuinely, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, and I do a lot of AMA and stuff, so I can promise you that if, if Yellowstone, when Yellowstone erupts, not if, when, it will more than likely be a small lava flow. I can't say there wouldn't be a super big you know, explosive eruption. There's always that tiny chance, but more than likely, it would be very, very small, not super explosive, and I promise you that, like, you can't cough at Yellowstone without it being recorded. The seismometers <laughs> actually were able, they kind of went quiet, and you could detect tourist activity on them, so you could see that during the pandemic. They're that sensitive, and we genuinely just have your, like, safety. That's all we want. So like we will tell you everything. <laughs> like trust me, we can't we can't like hold stuff back. We're bad. I'm a bad secret keeper. Like I would say something. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I had the question on the screen a second ago. <laughs> what do you think makes Twitch unique as a science? communication platform like what is it about twitch that facilitates so nicely this interaction that you have with the general public so i think um there's so many things that make twitch so awesome as a sitcom platform um for one like you can reach so many people that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise like i said you know i tap into gamers science i know you're friends with like a lot of music streamers and artists and like it's so awesome. Uh, there's so many people out there that we can just, yeah, stumble into your stream and learn something. Um, so yeah, definitely reaching a lot of people. Uh, also, the interactivity, I think, is really key. The fact that you are able to ask, like, actual scientists or, you know, science communicators, uh, like, questions um, and, and get answers or even, like, have a walkthrough of, like, you know, how to, like, critically think through something or find a good source for something, um, I think is really important. Um, so I, yeah, I was going to say that too. Like, yeah, you're like, yeah. you can follow up the question, even if you don't know the answer, you can go with chat through it. Like, well, this is how I would approach doing it. Right? This yeah. Is approach. It's really cool. Yeah, I definitely do that a lot on my stream because, like I said, like I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm sharing my passion, um, and I'm all down to like learn together. So, um, yeah. And I guess another thing, I, I mean, like alerts and all of that stuff too. I think makes you know Twitch really fun, and you can have some interesting things, and some of them can be educational as well. So. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I feel like I rambled there. No, no, it's great. And I agree. Uh, who else has some thoughts about what makes Twitch unique as a method of disseminating information that you're like really passionate about? I think the ability to, to build a community is big. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the really nice thing about it. You start from nothing. I mean, when I started, I was streaming to myself, basically. <laughs> and then after a while, you're streaming to these people, you see the regulars. There, you can you get to a point where chat actually answers its own questions sometimes, and, and then that's when it feels really good, right? They're like, they're they're really uh, buying into the whole thing. And Becoming self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> you just check the date, and like that's it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that for me, the community, and and, it, and it's really nice when you get positive feedback from them as well, because you know, it can be streaming is not easy always, right? And we have a lot of things to do, and sometimes it's hard to click that go live button, but when you know there's people waiting. Wonderful, yeah. I mean, absolutely. community is huge, yeah. Like, there's some people who come into my stream who are like, this is the only place that I feel like I'm comfortable to be myself and talk about space and nerd out. And that's like one of the nicest compliments I've ever gotten because, um, yeah, there, there's some areas of the world where, you know, this kind of stuff is looked down upon for some reasons, or, you know, maybe they're just not around the right people. And it's, yeah, I think it's so important to have communities where people feel safe and accepted and can be themselves and just nerd out over the things that they enjoy. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. I saw you buzzing in. I love buzzing in. I just want to echo what you know, Nerd Arena Moose said that you know, one part is big the interactivity. If I'm on YouTube explaining something, there's no feedback. Right? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if I know what I'm talking about. For me, too, like acronyms. I can't do acronyms. He, uh, artist streamers come in and say, I did a WIP. To me, that's a wing interference pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that's not what people are working on. It's that live feedback 
the live questions. Hold on a second. What did you mean by that? Let's go back 10 steps. Let's, I have a drawing tile. Let's draw it out. Let's draw out this genetic pathway of it and get that feedback. But then I think what Nerdowina Muabo is saying is the community. Like, our stream is an amalgamation of a ton of different communities. Our, we have a theme song made by the lovely Thug Shells over there. Our, we're on a stream team of makers and crafters called Moco Made. You know, we've got uh, one of my best, best friends over here in the front row here, they're gamers, right, and mental health chatters. Very, very different communities coming together over a love of science. And I think that shows we're not over-specialized in one direction. Anyone can be a scientist, anyone can come in, nerd out, have fun, and be passionate about just the biology of the world. Absolutely, yes, 100%. I see a lot of nodding heads here. I'm like, I'm under the impression you're all in agreement. <laughs> five out of five scientists agree. <laughs> that five out of five scientists never agree with anything. <laughs> you saw it first here at Twitch Con Las Vegas. take the chemistry of like different zones in a crystal and like, you know, do their, you can show people how lab work is done and, and bring people the science because it's all payable. It's so, you know, even as scientists, we have trouble getting funding to do the experiments. So if we're having trouble, what chance does somebody without that background have to get into it, you know? So we want to bring it to you and show you, give you that experience that you wouldn't get to have otherwise. Yeah, that's great, absolutely. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add that, uh, I guess kind of building on some of these other, other themes, Twitch gives us this opportunity to kind of humanize science and humanize scientists with other people. When you're streaming for multiple hours every week, multiple days every week, your true colors always come out. You can't fake that kind of thing. And people will see who you are and they can relate to you. There's this old phrase that's kind of corny, but I think it's true. It's that people don't know, uh, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so being able to actually Aww. like build a community and have heart to hearts with people and, you know, people come into, you know, to our channels to talk about science, but, you know, Sometimes we offer emotional support stuff. You know how streaming goes. You're all streamers, <laughs> Twitch viewers. Um, so being able to do that as a scientist is really, really important because we can show the world that, hey, we are human beings and science is not something that you should you know, necessarily be suspicious of or like dismiss because like all those eggheads in their laboratories like, are human beings just like you. And um, you know, we do what we do out of passion. And on the other side of that too, um, I think Twitch is really wonderful for science outreach because it allows us an opportunity to actually make a little bit of money too, which is difficult to do as scientists sometimes. Usually we're overworked and underpaid, and I'm, I've been really lucky to be able to make my living on this platform um, for the past couple of years, and that has been a tremendous, tremendous privilege. So it's, I, yeah, very, very grateful for that opportunity to be able to do outreach and field work and research all at the same time and get paid for it also. So uh, thank you to everybody who works at Twitch, who's built this platform and made this possible. Yeah, that's outstanding, wonderful. Well, uh, do you think that it is important for people to have access to scientists, to have contact with scientists and, and have such, a, such an ease of, uh, of, of communication across something like Twitch chat? Do you think this is like an important thing and, and in what ways is it important? No. No, okay. Not <laughs> <laughs> because there's like there's lots of streams there's lots of streams out there that are that are just like here's a picture uh, from my telescope and it's just you know, just like the tracking some star or celestial body and it, it, you're not seeing looking <laughs> there's a lot of streams that are like that yeah. and there's a lot of streams that are not there's a lot of like you know interaction with chat and stuff so yeah. tell me what your feelings are about uh, about the types of content that you do and whether or not you feel that it's important. For uh, for that, kind yeah. Of so, so I was obviously joking. I mean, I think it's critical. We, we talked about it before, right? 
I mean, you see during the pandemic, like the situation with somebody like Dr. Fauci, where the, the, I don't know whether it's an accessibility problem or, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but I think the more accessible scientists are to the general public, whether it be through Twitch or some other platform, the, the better the situation is going to be and the more we can be seen just as regular other people who are just trying to do our best. We're not trying to harm people or, you know, there's no like ulterior motive, we're just doing science because we love science. And, you, you can go and look at the papers, and some papers are hard to follow if you don't have a technical background, but you can go find summary papers and read the papers and follow the research itself. And if you bring that to Twitch and ask us questions, we can answer those questions, and I think that is how we build trust in science and scientists and the, and the whole process. Um, I, yeah, I would add on to that too. I think um, something that's super important uh, to have like access to scientists is there's so many like news article headlines that are over sensationalized and those are not scientists writing those um, and like that's okay but I think it's really good to have people kind of clarify it and explain it a little bit more there's been a, that happens very often in space news like the um, possible you know DMS signal on k218 b um, thing I won't get into that but um, that was like a whole thing and uh, other things, and I think it's really important, like not to like you know like kill the hype or anything. Like we should be talking about it, and it's cool, but it's also important to understand exactly what is happening, and that you know like yeah, get get, get a better understanding of stuff, I guess. Um, and I think another reason why it's important to have access to scientists is because I think it can really inspire people to go into STEM fields and not be as intimidated, um, and just feel like it's it's approachable. Like like they said, you know, we are normal people and. Like everyone can do it, and if you can ask someone about their field of research and kind of get a better understanding, you can maybe find like your more of like your niche path that you want to go into. Like I know a lot of people have not heard of astrobiology until they come into my stream, um, and I really hope, yeah, maybe one day one of those people will be the first to find life out there in the universe. Like I, I don't know, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, does anyone else have any further thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think uh, we owe it to you, right? So I wouldn't have a degree if it wasn't for the taxpayers. And it's I, that's another reason why we feel like it should be you like you are trained to be a scientist. You should therefore be an ambassador to science, and so you should, in my mind, have access to every single scientist who's on any paper and to ask any question that you want to. And unfortunately, that's a, an attitude issue that we need to change, not just in the U.S. but a worldwide issue. And so Twitch is allowing us to make you know the the first steps to be able to do something like that and maybe normalize that it's okay to have access to scientists and you don't have to be this ivory tower and you don't let anyone in. As Danny was saying, there's a you know, representation issue huge in science, but maybe if we can inspire that one kid to think, you know, join up in science, or I've gotten you know, so many comments that I used to be interested in this, but someone put me off. If we can reignite that curiosity instead of weaponizing science, I think that's the, you know, one of our big responsibilities of being here. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Anyone else? I think it's critical just to kind of echo everything that's been said, you know, just to provide access and increase trust so that people can learn how to critically think and make good choices. And that it's really that. It's about helping people to live their lives safely and the best that they can and think critically and have a good planet to live on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we should get to audience questions. All right, so <laughs> here's what we're gonna do. Everyone, uh, we're going to move to audience questions. If you have a question, please line up between these two podiums here on the side. We have, uh, yeah, we have space for some audience questions. Go ahead and make uh, either one of two lines. You can do two lines. You can do one line. Here we go. All right. Let's uh, let's begin. Go right ahead. Uh, this one's for Volcano Doc. I live in Colorado. How soon should I move out because of that super volcano? <laughs> <laughs> for what? I live in Colorado, so when that super volcano goes off in Yellowstone, like, how soon should I move? <laughs> Did you know that the easternmost volcano in the United States is in Colorado? It's Dotsero Crater, and it's a mar, which happens when groundwater comes into contact with magma, and it's this, like, explosion from underground, and it's just a hole. They're really cool. Um, but no, you would, like I said, the USGS, you can't cough or hiccup. 
at Yellowstone without somebody knowing about it, and it's always being watched. And I think, you know, so look at Mount St. Helens in 1980. We tried to do our best job, and some people still didn't listen. And unfortunately, that resulted in some loss of life, and we just want to keep people safe. So we would absolutely tell you, 100%. Uh, next question over here. Awesome. I have two very quick statements. First is, loved the Sonic Hedgehog reference. I'm a molecular <laughs> developmental biology undergrad, so that was always one of my favorite things to learn about. Um, and just appreciate it. I'm also a healthcare provider. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and so just really appreciate all of you talking about critical thinking when it comes to sources, because I know that there's a lot of misinformation out there, so that's really awesome that y'all are helping that effort to just get people thinking more critically. My question is, if you're, if you're at like your dinner party, what's your what's your go-to like fun fact you have from your field that you're not telling me? <laughs> Take away. Anybody can answer that one. Sharks, as a group, is paleo paleontologizing. Let me know. Have been around longer than Saturn's rings. That is my my double whammy space shark fact. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. And also uh, trees on Earth. So they've been around longer than those two. No. Super cool. <laughs> it depends on the on the company, but most often at uh, dinner parties, I find myself saying, "No, the moon landings weren't faked." <laughs> <laughs> I get the Yellowstone question every time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> the, the slide that didn't make it onto it already had that on there, so. <laughs> I think uh, my favorite is that if you look at an ant mound, you see different sh sizes and shapes of ants, right? There's big ones, there's little ones. Turns out they're all genetically identical. Uh, the DNA sequence is all the same between all of them, and they're only different because of how the genes are turned on and on and when they're turned on and off. And so I, that's always my, I study it and it's mind blowing to me. <laughs> and if I'm at a party and say there's know, chicken wings over on the table, be a wonderful opportunity to talk about how, strictly speaking, dinosaurs never went completely extinct. Birds today are living dinosaurs, and you're seeing parts of them right there on the table. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next up, next question. Uh, so I'm trying to get into the science and technology stream. And, um, my background is physics, uh, and I tried doing a lot of like lecture streams, but I felt like without the interaction of chat, and when you're starting out on screen, you don't really have that much interaction, it, it would be better formatted for a YouTube video. So how do you integrate your, your content into a more, and, and this was touched upon a little bit, but how do you integrate that more into um, just a more interactive uh, story without like equipment or anything like that? Because I mean, that's the easiest way. I love that you're doing that. I think that's so cool. I want to follow your stream. Yes. Um, I think something really fun you could do to make it interactive is do like the cool like physics experiments and stuff. Um, that stuff's always awesome. Um, and I think like, like there's nothing wrong with lecture formatting. I think if your passion seeps through and you're excited about it, like that shows as long as you like keep being consistent on Twitch and keep streaming. Um, you know, I, I think it can take you places. <laughs> I think it, another key to that as well is like not just. Don't just lecture for like 45 minutes or that. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, just, right. just do, do a few minutes and then like maybe do a giveaway or have chat, just interact with chat or take a question or just kind of break the lecture up and maybe what you think is going to take you 30 minutes to get through is going to take you three streams because yeah. you rabbit hole and you go off in different directions. And it, but it, yeah, it can be hard when you're starting out when there's no chat, there is no chat to interact with. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. But it's great that you're doing it. Yeah, I think I'm definitely pleased you keep doing it. And I would also like to follow you, but I can I can definitely identify because when I first started streaming, I recorded my lectures. I would edit my vods, and that was the lectures I would give to my students. So it can be really awkward at first, but I also think that you can take those and make valuable content. And I also I agree with Nerdwino. Don't go for just super long lectures, like. Dude, I don't even want to give a super long lecture. <laughs> I don't want to sit in it. Um, so take breaks, make it super interactive as much as possible, but do keep those bullet points, keep keep on track, and really get into the AMA of anything. You know, if there's something in the news that's cool that you're is in your background, like go into it. 
just to echo, that's how I started with my wife. I was terrified. I put on a button-down shirt. I don't wear button-down shirts. <laughs> and, um, it was a, a PowerPoint lecture, and it was, Lita watched it, she's like, oh, honey, that was kind of painful. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, luckily I had that feedback, and finally, just be unapologetically you, you know, and for us, it was embrace the chaos. We have so many redeems, like sound alerts that you can trigger, animations that run across the screen. And so, because it, it can be dry, right? If I'm talking about genetically engineering a, a, a mosquito, I might find it cool, but maybe no one else does. So maybe occasionally it's time to hit the panic button, show off some flashing lights, we reset, we have a chuckle, and then we go back to it. Uh, but it all depends on you know your community, your audience, and what makes you happy. Like, how are you really pushing forward the science you're excited about? And the, co the community will come after. They'll see your passion. And so just, you know, be you. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, if I had one piece of advice, it's pit chat against each other. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, hi. Um, you all have your particular niches uh, within science. Uh, I know the science community is pretty networked together, so you all follow each other, watch each other. Um, is there any science niche that uh, no one is streaming right now that you wish someone was streaming that particular thing? This is an excellent question. Anyway. I mean, uh, the audience on Twitch for science is pretty big. I, it's hard to say a specific niche that's missing, but if you have something that you want to stream, there, are, there is an audience out there for your stream and for your subject. So I would encourage you just to, to start streaming it. And uh, you, the science and technology tag is, or the category is okay, but there's people streaming and just chatting and other places as well. So it can be a bit hard to figure out who's streaming what, but I don't think it matters. Like I don't, if someone else wants to stream science and astronomy and launches, that's awesome. Because I'm not, I, you know, I stream three times a week for three or four hours. So if you can come on and stream either at the same time or different times, great. You know, there's just more, more eyes, more people, and more visibility. So. Yeah, excellent. Anyone else? Um, I was just gonna say that's such a hard question. I feel like there's so much diversity in science streamers on Twitch. Uh, we actually have, I think you know, like the Discord server, the Knowledge Fellowship. We have like a whole list of it, like science streamers on Twitch, and I'm struggling to think of one that like doesn't exist. Uh, there might be something, but yeah. <laughs> Pseudoscience. <laughs> there is, there is, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even gonna give them time of day here. <laughs> stickers on the, the chair so you can grab the QR codes off it in case y'all don't have it written down. But uh, uh, we do Mondays and Wednesdays around 6.30 p.m. Eastern, and then Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, and then 4.30 on Sunday. So we do six days a week. Uh, I stream on Sundays because I have, I went to that balancing life panel earlier. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to incorporating some of the things I learned. So I stream Sundays, uh, usually around the afternoon. Um, sometimes it can be earlier, but I do Discord, you know, I do Discord notifications for when things change. Uh, I'm Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, um, and I can give you a business card after this or something too with all my links. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, 8 p.m. Pacific. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for that question. Next up. This is sort of a threefold question, but my question would be, what is the most common misconception that you get in your field or in your chat? Why is it wrong, and why do you think so many people believe it? Oh. <laughs> I mean, immediately, it's like aliens, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, we, we get that a lot. Like, oh, have aliens visited? Oh, we have that. Thing turned out to be cake. I don't even know. It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, for, for me, I mean, my answer to that would just be like, we don't have any, we don't have it. I don't want to say any evidence. We don't have enough evidence. Um, so it's kind of talking through like the scientific process of like, you know, we need like repeated and just so much more evidence than, than what we have right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> I feel kind of bad shooting it down, but. <laughs> I would say, I mean, there's a couple of things, right? There's aliens, there's a and all this with 
that. Um, and then there's the moon landings is a constant one. And I think the trick is so you know. Uh, I was talking to Harry Teller earlier, and he said that his sister-in-law just texted him and said the moon landing. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, I think the important thing is to try and engage with those. Like it's very easy to dismiss those people and just be like, you know. I'm not engaging with you, and some of my chat I have to kind of rein in a little bit because they're like jumping people with, who come in with some kind of pseudoscience type stuff. But I think it's important to engage with those people and try and welcome them into your community and, and, and bring them into a more scientific community. Because if you don't, they're going to go find a community of pseudoscience people and, and people with interesting views that you you know that we don't want them to have. Like we, we want people to understand how the system works and how the process works for science. And if you just dismiss people. It's not healthy for for them or for you. Agreed. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Like our biggest one is people will come in and say, "Why are my tax dollars being wasted on a bug? That can't we can't learn anything about it." And so that's a misinformation from you know weaponizing of how science funding should be funded. And what the truth is, you know, seventy percent of your genome is identical to a fruit fly. I can clone a human gene, put it in a fly, and figure out what that gene does in a human. There's actually even a called the Undiagnosed Disease Network out of Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. There's kids, three of them a year, that are born with a genetic disorder and a farm, big pharma is not going to care because you're not going to make money. What do the scientists do? We clone the gene, put it in a fly and see what happens and we give them a diagnosis. And that's how we combat that, that it's not, you're, we're not wasting your money, we're trying to figure out a better society and that's why we study an insect. And that's always a big challenge because it's it's even on the news all the time, is why is fruit fly being studied? It's like, well, you're studying the neuroscience behind us, neurons signal into complex behavior and the genes behind it. And, and like Nerd Wiener said, never turn people away. You come at me with a question like that, we're gonna stop and we're gonna talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent question. We have very little time left, so let's do a quick speed run for the few people we have left. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm an engineering and robotics streamer, and one of the problems I often have is trying to like cut out the boring parts of the stream, like, oh, you know, this is going to be like a lot of debugging or something. And uh, I was wondering if you guys do that too, or if you try to spin that into a way to make it more entertaining for a general audience. Just chatting. There's nothing wrong with doing the boring parts that you say, you know, in your stream. If you're engaged with chat and talking about literally anything, like, have at it. Yeah, like, it, you can be, you know, debugging stuff, being like, oh, I had some good macaroni and cheese for dinner. Like, what, what's your guys' favorite food? And, like, that keeps it entertaining. You know, like, they might be working on their homework or doing something off, off your stream, you know, as well. But just listening and hanging out and, like, you know, vibing, <laughs> I think is, it, it goes a long way. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you. Excellent question. Next up. So, when you've been uh, working on your research, what is a field or a topic that you did not expect to have to learn and study while doing your original research? Well, what's this one? Oh, <laughs> nuclear explosions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's some like pretty intense physics, and I like did not ever anticipate that I would like have to figure that stuff out. But uh, yeah, that that was really difficult. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Thank you, excellent question. We have one last question for today. Go yeah, right ahead. Big fan. Uh, I'm gonna take it a little bit lighter. What is your favorite, or what's your, uh, I wrote it, don't forget, I already forgot. Um, what's your proudest Twitch moment related to science since you've all started? I got called Grand Ed Mark Rober once. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know whether to make the person a VIP or ban them. <laughs> that's such a hard question uh, I think just people in my community like I said earlier saying like thank you for having the space like I've learned so much um, and you know just they don't have people in real life that they can talk to about that stuff um, and I also think oh my gosh I totally just forgot what I was gonna say <laughs> uh, absolutely finishing the PhD I would not have been able to do it without the support of my family and my friends and community members and that was like the best thing that has ever happened, so. Oh my gosh, I remember what I was gonna say. It was just like the, um, when people are like, I had no interest in space and I didn't care about anything, but your passion, like your passion and enthusiasm is contagious and now I care about something I didn't, like you're gonna make me cry. Like that stuff is what I live for, so. No, I changed my mind, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. No, I think uh, second to debut my daughter on stream, so we can't be that. 
scientists, we got a sample that was 90 million years old, donated by a lab in China that Chad had been asking about for months and months and months, and debuting it. I didn't look at it before stream. We debuted it together, and I was even getting messy of seeing the ancestral origin of modern-day ants preserved in a piece of amber and sharing with the community. We can't beat that. I think for me, um, having people in chat say that they wanted to pursue a career in science, that they had a, I don't know, maybe they really liked dinosaurs when they were a kid, and that passion kind of died out for them, um, when it's dainty, might say. And then later, it was, was resurrected, you know, based on you know, tuning into, into the channel, and then uh, them deciding to, to pursue this further and learn more about it, and just having that spark there. Sometimes all it takes is just a spark mm -hmm. in order to get someone interested in science, and then the rest is up to them. And so for us being able to do that is such a tremendous privilege. Yeah, absolutely. It really is a privilege. Yeah. It like, really is. Yeah. It is. Well, I want to give a very special thank you to all of the people who've asked questions, all of the audience, and all of our lovely panelists here. Let's give it up for them. Thank you. Have a great rest of your con, everyone.